Hi everyone, let's talk about my top 10 overlooked games. So this is kind of, everything's incredibly subjective with any of these top 10 lists, isn't it? And just these videos in general. But overlooked, probably more than most, because you know, what I perceive to be overlooked, you might hear about all the time. But regardless, if, yeah, if, if a game is on here and you think, oh, well, we play that every day of the year. Yeah, you could just move on because you know about that. Hopefully you'll find out about some games that maybe you didn't hear about or didn't give a chance at the time. This is just 10 that I've picked anyway. Oh, and one little change, rather than just me talking about these games, and most of them, I think six or seven of them, I haven't done any videos for. They're overlooked, of course. Uh, so I can't have all of that up here. And rather than just show you the cover and describe all of it, I thought I'd show you uh, some of the game laid out. And you will see that over the enormous amount of time that that took to do, things get a little bit more and more rushed. But anyway, number 10 is Mondrian the Dice Game. Take it away, me. In Mondrian, we've got a grid of cards here that we want to obtain to try and make the best painting. But don't worry too much about the theme and stuff. It's all about chaos with dice more than anything. You start the game off with two dice each in this great big grid. And on your turn, you're gonna roll one of them. There's five different ways that you can roll dice. You can roll them with your left hand, your right hand, covering your eyes. You can drop one using the height of this paintbrush here. And from off the board, you can choose to flick one. As the rounds go on, you get more and more dice. So you'll be doing all five in the last round of the game. But as your dice actually end up on the cards, you'll get to take those cards if you've got the majority on them. If you go on the same card, the person who rolled the highest number will get the first preference for it but you also have to be able to afford the card. The pips on the dice are like your currency, so I could buy this one, but if Marty wanted to buy this five here, he would have to pay three to supplement this. He could try and roll more dice onto this card so he'd be able to afford it, but you do start off with a blank one, two, three, so you can like replace ones that you are taking to like supplement your income. But over the course of the game as well, these cards are going to get taken by players. And so it's gonna get harder and harder, even though you've got more dice, it's gonna get harder and harder for you to actually put the dice where you want them. And then at the end, you're trying to assemble a painting, trying to get the majority of different colors. But really where it's all at is the joy and the chaos of watching everyone desperately try and scrabble for these cards. Thanks, Tom. So yeah, Mondrian, it was always a kind of mainstay filler for our regular group of four. And yeah, it's it's just great big daft laughs, really, isn't it? You could I can imagine you know there being uh, more strategy to it, the more skill that you have. But uh, as I mentioned there, I think uh, we're all about the same level of kind of just just roll it and hope that it stays in the grid. Don't worry too much about what cards you're gonna get. And yeah, the the actual joy of watching people's crazy throws with their you know hand over their eyes or with uh, just uh, dropping it or flicking of course yeah it's really really great Mondrian the dice game uh, so number nine is super mother load so here we're trying to drill stuff basically here is the stuff in the ground we want it and the money that it's going to get us it's another kind of deck building game we have some starting pilots you play them on your turn in a group of a matching color so i've played these two blues then i could drill a two by one shape your drilling has to connect to existing tunnels or start from the surface of course so i could drill out you know a bit of gold and a bit of coal and i grab the mineral tokens for the things that i have just drilled and then in the future people could be drilling things over here if things have got certain steel borders you need that particular card color to be able to take them if you've got bomb tokens later, certain cards have a bomb pattern on them. So if you used a bomb token as well as this card, it would create a certain shaped hole. All the minerals you get with one action need to go onto a pilot card from your supply here. These are all the rest of the pilot cards in price order, and you need to decide which one pilot they're going on. So I've got $5 here, and so I want to unlock the, the wild card first. So maybe I'd want to unlock the red here because it's two icons just on a single card and a great big bomb pattern. And special bonuses for buying those cards. We're shooting for achievements like having a load of cards in your hand or getting a load of bomb tokens or buying a particular number of certain colors of cards. We can find artifacts that will give us special abilities like get bomb tokens, duplicate a mineral tile, all sorts of things. And when all of the artifacts have been taken from a board, we are now able to drill to a greater depth. 
and more and more and more as the game goes on you'll of course probably have to get rid of the earlier numbers from the board as you go on as you keep drilling and drilling to reach all that glorious stuff right at the bottom there you go so super mother load uh quite a different theme and the mechanics of the game work together beautifully with it it's it's good as well because you know it's based off this uh, video game that i ended up playing after i'd played the board game that's very good i recommend it uh but managing to have this you know drilling game brought in a competitive way we're all drilling this same stuff we're all vying for the best minerals but uh trying to have the right pilots in our hands to be able to combine them to get them because you would want to mine as much as you possibly could in one great big go but is it better to just get one great one really nice gem that you need because there's a really neat restriction over getting those pilot cars you know whenever you get minerals they go on one of your stacks and so you could be overpaying for stuff but maybe you really really could do with that card uh, the different effects you can get from the artifacts and you know those cards themselves but the the bombs as well being able to use a card for to do a great big pattern instead of just combining with a load of things yeah it's uh, it works together beautifully and i kind of think from looking at this as well it's kind of like really original games as well uh, even though it's based on uh, a video game but yeah i think uh, super mother load stands alone brilliantly number eight is xenon profiteer it's a deck building game where we are trying to well profit from Zenon. We are, well, it's a deck kind of deconstruction game. You start off with a you know, deck of 10 cards. It's two upgrades and two packets of air. A packet of air in this game is a nitrogen, an oxygen, a krypton, and a xenon. And you shuffle them all together. And on your turn, it's a deck builder, five cards. And you want to basically have your hand be entirely xenon. So the first thing that you will do is distill. You take the lowest ranked element from your hand so either the nitrogen then oxygen then krypton then xenon so this is actually as an example this is an incredibly lucky first hand because you would distill all of the nitrogen from your hand that goes back into the pile and then my hand only contains xenon as in terms of elements and so the xenon gets put aside for later to be used in contracts that represents that it's been you know isolated and bottled you can air or wipe air gets you two dollars and it also gets you one of each of the cards, a packet of air into your discard pile. Or you can wipe one of the lines of cards. It's you know, a deck builder where rather than a big display of things, it's a constant you know, conveyor belt of cards. And then you can buy or bid. So buy, pick a card and buy it. You can get upgrades from over here that uh, can be quite expensive, but really, really powerful. Like they can let you distill twice or let you bid and buy. So you can pay the huge amount to just install it straight away. It goes straight into your system. You see this nice little pipeline here and it's active. Or you can pay the little cost, say the two, and it goes in your discard pile with the rest of the cards. Then when it comes out later, you can pay the five and install it. You can buy pipelines that are basically contracts with local businesses and stuff, but they increase your hand size. You can have one of each color and they'll give you loads of points. So if you just got one, it's a point for each at the end of the game. If you've got two, it's two points for each and then three points for each if you've got loads of them. And then there are contracts that don't cost anything, but you can only have one at a time. You don't have to have any Zenon to be able to take one. But once you have completed it, so this one wants three, as soon as I've got three Zenon over here, I would earn six points and get a dollar and you put the Zenon that you needed a side to it to show that you've done it. So I would have three there. I've done it all nice and fine. And so they would go back to the supply and this is a completed contract. I can now get another contract. Instead of buying something though, you can bid. So you can use your bid tokens. So each action lets you put a bid token out on a card. When somebody wipes the line, any cards with bid tokens are kept. If you buy this card, you get a discount for every one of yours on it, but you have to pay one for every other person's discount token on it as well. And again, another one where the, I don't really know what's that similar to Zen and Profiteer. It is a deck builder. I suppose there's deconstruction in games like Dale of Merchants or Valley of the Kings where you've built up this amazing deck, but you have to tear it apart to be able to win. It's kind of its own beast though, Zen and Profiteer, because rather than having to strip out your most useful cards, you are trying to distill away all of this stuff that's absolutely useless to you. But having said that, there are upgrades and things that can help you get rid of stuff sooner or reward you for having certain cards in your hand. I think it works beautifully. And again, it's just a game where the 
the theme is married to the mechanics of the game so beautifully. And I think it comes across in a fantastic way. There, there is kind of scope for a bit of meanness in the, the bidding stuff because, you know, if, you, if someone bids for something, they're stopping it being cleared away and you can put your own bid tokens on there as well, especially if you've got ways of getting more of those out at once. You can be ramping up the price for them, but at the same time, they can switch to something else. But that's, that's just a little minor thing. But the, the main thing to note is, yeah, Zenon and Profit is worth checking out. <laughs> Number seven is Far Space Foundry. Here we are mining and basically shuttling things around. It's pick up and deliver, really, but in a really interesting way, I think. And it's a game of two halves. We spent the first half trying to get as much of this stuff as we possibly can, and then spend the second half of the game trying to make it worth as many points as we can. We each have little freighters and warehouses and decks of pilots. The decks are the same, but we shuffle them and have some different ones in our hand. You always start with the commander, and they have different numbers on them. And it's all about shuttling stuff. So you play a pilot with a number on it, so this pilot number eight. I could play, and I would grab a shuttle and put it in space number eight. Now, the number of attempts it took to dock is, you know, how long it was out there getting stuff, and it's your capacity. So it one attempt, it was fine. So I would get one sky right into my warehouse. But then if Marty wanted to come over and do the same thing, he could use his X here, his commander. Now this is use the number on the die or re-roll the die and then use that number. But it's already showing eight. So he would try and dock at eight. Can't would go to the next one. So he took two attempts. He would get two sky right. So it's all about you know clever manipulation of these numbers and seeing what opportunities are available. You'd also be mining the Rubion as well and end up with a warehouse with a fair bit of different stuff in there. Also going into where the shuttles end up is the abilities around the outside here. They all correspond to different actions. The processing plant lets you discard a Skyrite and let you turn a Rubion into a Galactium. You can see down here from the items that have been drawn this game that you know you need a load of Galactium and Skyrite. You can stop planning ahead for what you want to try and get ready for. You grab the alien pilot deck and you reveal the first four cards. Oh, who shuffled these? <laughs> so you show everyone the cards and then you get to pick one of them and you can see they've all got various abilities that will let you change the, treat the number of the die as if it was too higher or lower or go either side of the number on the die and take more things and all sorts of special abilities. You get to take one of these aliens, and then if you don't already have it, you get to take the top freighter of that color. The only stuff that you're going to get to keep to take into the second half of the game is stuff on your freighters. So you definitely, oh yeah, and I've set them up with all the upgraded ones face up, haven't I as well? <laughs> so you only get to go into the second half of the game with the stuff that's on the freighters that you have. Oh, and you pay a credit, of course, these beautiful metal credits. The other main thing you'll be doing is shipping back. So this is like the opposite. So you would use a number and based on how many attempts it took to find a ship, you get to ship that many things back. So I could choose, say, number three in this case. Obviously, when you're shipping things back, this is probably going to be a lot more full. But if I chose three here, there's no ship here. One, two, three, four, five. Ship goes away, and I would get to put five things from my warehouse out onto freighters. So I can be loading it up with a load of Skyrite and Galactium for the second half of the game. Once everyone has played all of their pilots... The game then shifts into the beta phase. The cantina disappears. Your warehouses get that little bit smaller. And we get a whole new set of icons. So now, when we shuttle things, they are being shuttled. Rather than from the planets, they're off limits and they're just discard piles now. But now we are shuttling things back from all of our freighters into our warehouse. And then we are doing things, hopefully getting products for them. And then taking stuff back, we're most likely going to be taking products up. At the manufacturing plant, you can access one product type. And they've each got a cost and tell you how many of those things that you get, bearing in mind all of your storage limits and stuff. Like the helmet costs one Galactium, but gives you three things. So you want to make sure that you've got all the space for it. And there's a limited number of all of these things. Once you've got some items... The charging station will let you for free charge one of your products, making it worth an extra point. They say how many points they're worth at the bottom anyway. Or you can spend a credit to do all of your products. And you can also upgrade empty freighters. So you have to make sure that they're empty first, but you can upgrade them and they've got a better storage capacity. Because if you don't, 
unupgraded ones are worth minus two points each at the end. I love Fast Space Foundry. Well, I love all of these games. I've kept them despite many, many heartbreaking calls. Uh, so, yeah, I love that it's, it's this really restrictive game of kind of logistics of moving this stuff around, of getting the most for every turn, whether it's trying to make sure that you know, you're using the right number compared to the shuttles that are in there to try and get the most transport for your money, but also you want to end up on a number that's going to give you an action you can get the most out of. I love that it's in two halves, so all of the mining and getting that stuff onto your ships is... Uh, is you know, your focus of the whole thing and then suddenly halfway through the game you're no longer able to do that and now you need to work out okay well this is what I've managed to end up with this is what I've managed to keep with me what can I do with this stuff and then how do I get all of that stuff back on my freighters as well uh, it's as I've mentioned it's got a load of mini expansions that came with it that I haven't even dug into yet uh, I've thought of this this has been a really good top 10 for going back to these games that I've kept around thinking yeah I, I, I know that I really love that I don't want to get rid of that but then actually coming to them and being like when when's the last time I opened the box of Far Space Foundry or some of these other things or Xenon Profiteer or uh, Super Motherload it's been quite a while and uh, for a couple of them certainly it's been kind of like well I could I could vaguely say what it's about but oh yeah it's, you do all of this stuff as well uh, yeah I highly highly recommend uh, Far Space Foundry Number six is Burano. Burano is a beautiful, colourful Euro all about shipping and getting goods and making things and basically building. It has these beautiful, chunky, wooden cubes that at the start of the round, you look at your supply and you're going to make a cube pyramid that is going to restrict your access to certain actions. At the beginning of the game, actions are randomly seeded to which colour corresponds to which action. And then you grab 14 of your cubes. Obviously, if you're actually playing it, you would be putting thought into this uh, because you need a 3x3 three three at the bottom and then it's a 2x2 two two on top of that. And then finally, one cube on top, which is going to be the only cube you have access to right now because this is going to be your first action. Then you have access to all four of those. As soon as you take that one away, you can get access to this one in the corner. You see how it goes from there. There's an interesting way to do your moves. You know, you get one action. If you only do one action, you'll earn a coin. But if you want to do more than one action on your turn, it's going to cost you progressively more. The actions are take a cube and put it in your preparation area where you've got space for three. Build a house. So take it from your preparation area and put it somewhere in Burano. And if you can tell here, there's this board that's got all of these holes in it that uh, line up with the graphics if you do it properly. And uh, yeah, you'll be putting your cubes down in there. And they'll correspond to the actions you can take, like moving your ship around to these different ports. You basically have this special little schedule ring that's randomly generated and you look at the colours that the arrows are pointing at and the more that you can match up on the islands, the more cards that you'll get and you leave workers behind or you can go to these ports and kind of like in Trajan based on whether you've got pairs or four different ones or four equal things uh, you can come to the ship there's two different docks though where they are so you have to be you know connected to there and then once the ship has been sold to it moves to the other dock so all four could potentially be on one side you can do lace making which basically you are trying to match colors again you can place your first worker anywhere but as soon as you've placed one down, you need to place orthogonally adjacent. So then the colors are really going to matter. And always based on how many you got out. So if you've got three workers out there, this wheel changes. So those colors are constantly shifting around as well. And the more workers you've got out through fishing and through lace making, the more coins are visible on your player board and you can take an income action to get that much money. So the other thing that you can do is place roofs down rather than just put cubes out. You have to match the colors that are out here. So I could place this roof on here because it's matching to a green and a blue cube. So as one of my actions for the turn, I could pop that on there. You can choose to get a couple of points or a building card that will change the rules of the game, like move your ship more, get more points for certain types of fish card, let you mismatch roof tiles, things like that. And then you get a bonus based on what's the, in the middle. So straight points or points based on all your workers that are out for fishing or in the lace making. And it's basically a great big lovely point salad. So I think Brano was one of the early games that kind of brought to attention not just Empress for the publisher, but you know Taiwan board game design as a, as a group, as a collective of uh, different publishers and designers, and see the kind of wildly different and inventive ideas that were out there. The Perfumer is one of my uh, fairly early videos where an integral part of the game is basically 
these scratch and sniff things. You are trying to competitively guess the sense of these uh, these various uh, hidden things. You can't see the titles of it, but you are through your sense of smell. Uh, you are trying to work out what those scents are. Uh, but yeah, Burano. It is a point salad game that's maybe I, th I think there's more to it than just you know the ship action that does kind of bring these feelings up of Stefan Feld point salads. Not you know exactly. It's got maybe it's got fewer elements certainly than something like Trajan. Fewer mini games going on, but more kind of uh, bigger ones rather than lots of little ones all going on at the same time. It's you know, mainly the the cubes is the kind of big draw for it, isn't it? The kind of table presence of these beautiful chunky wooden cubes and a lot of board gaming is that uh, beautiful tactile nature of everything. Uh, and especially it looks brilliant as you are building floor upon floor up to three, I think, uh, and the city of Verona comes to life, more so in a game with more players. There's just going to be fewer cubes in a game with uh, fewer players, isn't there? But there's that, and then there's the ships and the fishing cards and the lace factory. Uh, so it's it's the kind of merging between those, but just just from those fewer elements, there is so much to think about, especially when it's combined with you know your your sequence wheel, uh, which colours you need to match up with that will influence the particular action that you do. But have you left yourself open to doing that when you were building your cube pyramid? That's something I could see leading to a load of uh, kind of analysis paralysis because everybody needs to do that at the start of the round. And yeah, you could really tie yourself in knots getting that uh, getting that wrong, locking yourself out of actions that are any use to you because you put the wrong colors in the wrong order. It's not completely overly restrictive, but yeah, it is an element of it. But another one that, what, what else has used that kind of bizarre action selection mechanism? And I have gone on about lately, as I've done uh, videos for these new Steffenfelds and Amerigo that I did recently, how much of a draw the action selections were in things like Amerigo, the Cube Tower, and Macau, the Windrose. That, yeah, some some of his uh, more recent ones haven't really done that for me, haven't really had that interesting an action selection mechanism. And Burano uh, kind of stands among them with uh, a really eye-grabbing and really interesting, thoughtful uh, action selection thing. Burano! Number five is Nauticus. Nauticus. It's a game all about building ships and stuff. It's got this lovely action selection where the first player chooses the first action, as you would expect, and uh, they get a special bonus for picking the action. So they would get like a worker and a good for here. It gets slid down because no one else gets that. And that is the current action. They take that action and then everyone in turn takes it. This would be getting ship parts. It tells you around the outside how much each part is going to cost you. You can just get like an individual ship like that, just a little one. Or you can start to get pieces if you put them separately. You can never join them up, but you could make, you know, a size two boat or a size three boat or go the whole hog and make a size four boat. They're obviously going to be harder to complete, but you get more bonuses if you do the bigger ones. And here you'd be tempted because the middle pieces are free. So you can buy as many things as you like in these blue actions. Each purchase costs you a worker. You get this many virtual workers. You never get those cubes, but every player gets them for the action. You can spend extra if you've got them. The first of each costs this around the outside, so the middle pieces are free, so you probably would be tempted to make a, a bigger ship, perhaps, here. If you want to buy more than one of something, every subsequent one costs four, no matter what it says around here. If you buy every individual thing, you get a bonus one. But everything you get for free, whether it's bought or rewarded, goes into your warehouse and doesn't go straight out. So these could be made as just a ship in my player area but i got this middle piece for free so it has to go there so maybe i would want other pieces to be in my warehouse to bring them out as one big ship because you can't expand it later on and if i put these as separate ships i can't decide i link them up later on and so you go round and round buying parts of ships you buy masts as well with certain flags on them sails that have those as well that you want to match up you can buy goods that go under the hull parts of your ships uh, transport lets you take everything from your warehouse and do stuff with it. You can deliver all your goods on fully loaded ships and you get points at the end for how many you've delivered of each good. You can get points for all the crowns that you can see in your player area. You can get crowns on the masts and the sails. And for passing as well, you can earn more crowns. And every time you finish a ship, so it's got a hull a mast and a sail, you can pick a bonus for every mast that's on it. You can have each bonus at most twice, 
Uh, but yeah, you can get a load of money, you can get points, you can get workers, you can get goods, you can get... This is how you get the crown masts and sails because they aren't available for purchase out here. At the end of the game, you get points for your constructed ships. The bigger the ship, the way more points that you can get for it. Uh, and you convert everything that's left over into money and translate that into points. The goods that you delivered based on how many of each type, so the more of each type that you can do, the more points you'll get for it. And that is Nauticus. So Nauticus, designed by Kramer and Kiesling, Amazing design duo, design beautifully elegant games, you know, games that they don't have a massive rules overhead, but from uh, your kind of limited actions, just beautiful, beautiful decisions come out of them. So again, a really interesting action selection thing so that we're going around someone choosing a main action and everyone else getting to do it, but the person that picked it getting to do a little bonus. So the bonus is influencing you as well as you know, what, what would be really useful for me that wouldn't necessarily be very useful for anyone else right now. If I've got a load of goods and I can see around the table that everyone else is kind of struggling for them, I probably want to ship goods right away so I can get the benefit of it and uh, everybody else will have to kind of wait around for it or have to pick that first uh, when they get first choice in a future round as well. Maybe it comes from the game Shipyard, but I really love uh, building these ships out of tiles. You, know, you can see a, a much heavier <laughs> Rondell-based game uh, I did a playthrough for called Shipyard for that. But yeah, I love all of these different tiling things coming together. You're trying to match up the, the masts and the sails. Do you get crowns that you could be worth more points later, but they can only be gotten through rewards? And just the central thing of not, not just picking that main action tile for your turn but when it comes to your turn which things do i want which things do i need the most because you, know, you don't necessarily vitally need everything that you're buying but you can be thinking well it's free it goes to my warehouse but it's it's free i might as well have it right now but it's going to cost a worker am i going to need that desperately for something in the future am i going to have the money to be able to replace that worker am i going to desperately need that worker to get the thing back out of the warehouse when it comes down to it and the freedom as well to if the action's been picked and you have enough money, you can keep getting whatever you want. You know, whatever those prices say, the second and onwards of any of the things cost you four, no matter what. So it can be about as well storing up enough money so that when that action comes out, being able to just be completely free, no matter what the price of stuff is, you just get as much of it as you need, which can be fantastic, especially if you are going for you know great big amounts of a certain good to try and get the most points from it. Yeah, it just uh, works together beautifully. Nauticus. Number four is Queen's Architect. Queen's Architect is all about building lovely things for the Queen. We have a rondelle that determines the actions we are allowed to do. You can move one to three spaces on it and you can get money. Certain workers allow you to turn them to get more money. The workers are all hexagons and it works in a beautiful way. You've seen them, You can get new workers from here. They cost more as they go up, but they last longer. This arrow means when you use this guy, he's gone. So he only costs one, but he's one use. You can travel around. You can see from the top of the board, first space is just free and then it costs you more and more the further you want to go. And you want to go to the places that want the craftsman that you've got. So you'll start off with two but uh, you want them to be a particular type. So if I came down here, I would also want a glass blower. So if I had hired, say, a glass blower from here, and uh, that would actually come in at five, it would be really lovely. There is also the in action where you can basically rest your workers. Uh, the more types of workers you want to rest, the more it's going to cost. But uh, you pick types based on these tiles that are here. And so if I wanted, uh, these are actually in a, quite a nice position, so I wouldn't want to roll them back, but because the, the numbers aren't, it's not so simple as they go from high to low. Uh, they they waver around, as you can see on these. So you might have just done a really great build. And so this has gone from a four to a one. But if you put it in, the in, it'll go back. But then there's a restriction. You can't just keep doing the same type. Next time you come into the inn, uh, those tiles won't be available. And you'll need to wait for them to come out again. So the main thing, though, is building. And actually, I'm completely... This, this place uh, wants a type I haven't got. So let's say I went over here. So they want uh, needlework and glass blowing. And I have got those workers here. So I could do a build. And this is how you win the game. This is a race. Using the values of those workers. So five and three is eight. I would get eight building points. You are restricted by the size of the city, basically, as to how much building power you can possibly have. So a maximum of 10. But I could take that eight that I've earned and move up this track. 
getting to the top of this track is how you win the game. So eight is actually just <laughs> off getting up here. This is randomly generated at the start of the game. So nine would take me to the next stage. So maybe I would have wanted to manipulate it or get a different worker so I could do nine. But if I did eight, I would get, I would go up there for four and then I would get four bonds uh, to make up the difference. Once you have built in a city, you can't build in there again. And the next player to go there will get a minus two penalty to their build because the queen is less impressed with buildings in there now. And so you go round and round recruiting more workers because as you use them and you use them on the arrow, they go away and you'll want to be using them for money and stuff like that. You'll be going around trying to get up this track and then the first player to get up here, get back to the capital and then do a build with any workers for 15 wins the game. Oh, Queen's Architect is so good. Uh, you can see actually Rachel's top 10, I've played most of my games with, uh, it's one of her favourite games of all. And uh, I think it's absolutely fantastic as well. And that's, yeah, it, it didn't get uh, a fair look at at the time, I don't think. Uh, so yeah, the, the main mechanism of getting these workers getting the right combination of these workers, getting the right, getting them at the right stages as well. Uh, whether it is twisting them back through the inns, buying them at a certain stage in the market, or uh, using them as day labor to turn them an extra bit. Uh, there, there is, uh, there's, there's a beautiful puzzle of lining all of this stuff up, as well as going into, well, which city can I go to? Now I've gone over this total, so do I waste the extra, or do I go to this extra city? But now I'm gonna need an extra worker for that. And all of this is kind of wrapped up in a race game. So it's it's really tense, because can you be affording to waste that turn to go and get the extra people? Can you afford the, the money for it? Uh, the, the, the score track as well. A recent game, Under Falling Skies, does a similar thing, and I'm sure other games have done it too, where we have this track that is made up of variable steps. So you can have games that have just got really, you know, starts off really easy or starts off with a great big jump that's going to take a while for anyone to move up it, but that you are not just, you're of course trying to get uh, the, the best number that you can, but you're trying to see how many steps can I reasonably take up this track. Uh, you know, is it worth if if the if it's a three and then a seven? Is it worth me doing like a nine build? Couldn't I do something about it to get to ten to get that other step? Because you always get rewarded with the uh, steps that you missed. You get these bonds that can be traded in for money uh, later on that will uh, offset anything that was wasted there. But potentially it could be much, much more useful to you to get that extra step, especially since it is just a race. You know, whoever gets to the top of that and then get back, gets back to the middle and does one last big build wins the game uh, from under everyone else. So yeah, it's a really kind of tense, exciting atmosphere around it as well. It's fantastic, Queen's Architect. So number three, now we enter the realm of games that I did videos for that I can just put up here. Uh, and I'm not sure how I rank these. Are they my favorite ones? Maybe. Uh, so Dawn of Peacemakers is a game from a couple of years ago from uh, Snowdale Design, uh, also designer of uh, Dale of Merchants, one of the best uh, series of deck builders around. So Dawn of Peacemakers is kind of, a, well, it's a it's kind of a meta theme. It, it feels like to me anyway. Well, the theme really is that these factions are fighting and we are, you know, Im impartial outsiders. Well, we're not really impartial. We haven't got a side in this argument that they've got. Our whole philosophy is you shouldn't be going to war. You shouldn't be fighting with each other. And so through various kind of, underhand methods we are trying to sap the morale of both sides in this cooperative game we're trying to work together to sap the morale of both sides so that they both decide that this particular battle that they're fighting isn't worth it and they'll just go home it's a campaign game so not legacy where it's uh, just one and done uh, it can all be reset but there is you know sealed decks and uh, sealed envelopes and all sorts of surprises inside it and is telling a great big narrative story as it goes on that I found really, really interesting and, uh, well, rather interesting, really exciting and enjoyable uh, as well. But uh, outside all of that stuff, just the core theme of the game, the, the, the factions that are fighting are going on these, you, you draw cards for them basically. There's a really nice system of uh, the cards linking together to show you what they're gonna do on their turn. You can check out the playthrough actually. It's, this is the area as well as where <laughs> there can be some stuff here, but also, yeah, you can watch, you can watch the actual game in action. 
so they're going on this kind of AI game where they're kind of playing an aggressive game. They're playing a, a kind of war game uh, against each other. And I really love kind of thematically and uh, mechanically as well that we're taking this game as, as someone that really doesn't like negative interaction in a game, does not want to fight in a board game whatsoever. It's kind of, yeah, just beyond me. Why we would play that when there is all of this stuff without any of it that uh, we can enjoy far, far more. Uh, for me personally, all of it's really personal. For you, type a comment that you love them. Good that you love them. <laughs> so uh, yeah, Dawn of Peacemakers is, well, not really like a response to it. Who knows the intentions of the designer? But you know, for, for me as someone that doesn't like that stuff, that we are taking on the roles of people that want to stop this war game, well, the actual war in terms of the story. We are playing these characters that want to stop this AI controlled game from happening. I really, really enjoy that as an extra dimension onto an already fantastic game. And I would love to see more stuff uh, you know, coming from that kind of philosophy. I think it's a really great message that is, you know, it's it's not in your face. It's, well, it, the game is kind of called that and that is what you're doing in it, but it's not uh, it's not trying to push an ideology on you at all. But I think it's uh, it's much better than just, uh, oh yeah, these people are fighting and stealing from each other again. Dawn of Peacemakers. Two is Subdivision. There's no point teasing it for a few seconds, it's right there. Uh, so this is kind of going back in terms of playthroughs. I think this is one of the maybe single digits playthroughs I did uh, on the channel, so I don't know how confident I am about having it up there. Uh, but yeah, this is a, thematically, it's in the series of Suburbia uh, from uh, Bezier Games, where we are building great big cities made out of hexes. In Subdivision, we're kind of making one of them, kind of. It's much more of a puzzle than Suburbia. That is a, a lovely puzzle in itself. Uh, we are trying to get these these various elements. There is uh, to do with building lakes, to do with building roads, to do with the, the normal stuff that you would expect about uh, residential and commercial stuff. But you are trying to get it connect. You're trying to get the roads to connect to as many different things as possible. You're trying to surround the water with a load of stuff, which you know does sound a lot like uh, Suburbia. But it's all wrapped around this uh, this really, really tight puzzle. You know, there is a die saying where you're allowed to put your piece for this turn. So you have freedom that you don't necessarily have to build it adjacent, but you'll soon find how you have uh, painted yourself into a corner by uh, not covering up certain spaces because some have uh, really big penalties. And you'll see when you want your road to connect to all the stuff towards the end that you've made it so you can't uh, quite do it properly. There is a draft of the tiles as well that rather than it being this uh, this great big uh, conveyor belt of things getting cheaper and cheaper, you are picking from a hand that we are drafting between each other. So you kind of got some knowledge of what is coming up after. Uh, yeah, the, what, drew to, what drew it to me at first is definitely the theme. I absolutely love Suburbia. But uh, yeah, I, I, I still don't think there's really anything like Subdivision. And uh, I would love to see more in this kind of vein or more from designer Lucas Hedgren, because I think it's wonderful. And finally, I don't know how underrated an Uwe Rosenberg game can be, but uh, maybe in the sphere of Uwe Rosenberg games, this is kind of underrated. Makata, uh, this is a game of trading goods, basically. You are traveling the world, gathering these goods cubes and fulfilling contracts with them. You know, it's it's just wildly different from a lot of Euro games, never mind just uh, other Uwe Rosenberg games. There's not a worker to be placed in sight. Uh, we are moving around this map, but the, the central thing is kind of time. Uh, the time it takes for you to go between these locations. Uh, there's a really interesting way of how they fill up, you know, taking from one makes other locations fill up with goods, simulating this network of trading goods really beautifully. And you are, you start off with really kind of simple contracts that only want certain cubes. And cubes can represent other things as well. Cubes represent uh, a, a few different goods that you decide. So you just get a black cube. This place makes black cubes. But then when the black cube comes down, you can decide how to split that between the different types of black cubes. You, you decide to designate which goods they are because the contracts want specific goods. And they start off fairly easy to, to meet. And there is you know a great big hierarchy. It's, it's another race game. Uh, it's not kind of as uh, as quick and furious as uh, Dawn of Pe as 
Queen's Architect. So we end up looking at my list, just reading the long one. Just read the first long title that you see. Uh, but yeah, it's it's a race to get to the, the best contract, really. Although then there is points. It's not just as simple as I've gotten to the end and now this is it. There is a load of points for all the other stuff that you've done along the way as well. But yeah, there is a, a lovely progression to this stuff that you are doing these really simple contracts as you start and kind of wondering how you're ever going to progress to you know, the, the great big the great big demands of the, the level 10 contracts and stuff. But you are getting help from the various power cards as well. That, uh, that I'd say that the game is hard to get. I think, or has been as far as I've looked, like a lot of these games that I kind of rave about and forget about that they're harder to get. I had to get myself a German copy that's almost language independent. I mentioned the ability cards reminded me that mine was second hand and someone had just written a bit of English text on a couple of those cards. I think other than that, it's pretty much uh, good to go. But yeah, it, it really stands out as a, a beautiful game. It's a really uh, interesting puzzle. It, it's really... It's interactive in the sense that everyone is affecting this map. The goods that they are taking are obviously taking things away from what you would want, but they are also filling up different areas, giving you opportunities. And depending on how much time you want to spend, uh, you can go to you can get bonuses for going to certain places, but you don't want to just go to them repeatedly because they're not going to have more of their main cube at the time. Yeah, you can watch the playthrough to uh, see it maybe in a more clear sense. It's been a long day. <laughs> but uh, yeah, Makata is an absolutely fantastic game. But I would say uh, for all 10 of these, depending on your taste, depending on whether how long a game you're looking for, uh, I, would, I would check out some of these because, yeah, I, I don't see them talked about a lot. And it kind of makes sense, doesn't it? There's thousands of games coming out every single year. Loads and loads of them. Very exciting to me. So, yeah, it's it's obvious that some games are just not going to get talked about that much through no fault of their own. Hey, check one out and let me know what you think about it. Or maybe you've been playing Subdivision this whole time. I said this at the start, didn't I? I'd really like to hear from someone that's been playing Subdivision all this time, though, because... It deserves it, doesn't it? All 10 of them do. Stop picking ones out. I'm going to go, though, now. If you would like to see more, there is over 400 playthroughs on this channel. Hopefully some of those would appeal. Three of these have gotten playthroughs. Hey, and as well, I have a Patreon that helps me keep making these playthroughs. It's patreon.com forward slash slickerdrips if you'd like to help me keep making videos. Uh, any support there would be massively appreciated. Thank you to everyone that already does. See, there's the support I'm talking about. Uh, but, uh, yes, I... Not only are these topics voted for, but the videos that I cover are voted for as well. And, uh, well, anyone can suggest uh, ones to cover, but every month I do vote for the patrons to cover some of these. And uh, I think a few of them have been on votes. And obviously, if there's something new and amazing, I don't blame you for voting for that. I want to see these as well. But uh, it's fireworks time almost. I don't know if that's even coming through and it just looks like I'm hearing it in my head. Uh, but yeah, give give them a suggestion. Give them a vote if they ever come up, I think, because you'll be, uh, you won't be disappointed unless you didn't like it. I'm going to go now, though. This has been a massive outro. Bye, everyone. <laughs>